Science fiction, dice rolling, and area control are staples of the board game hobby. These and other familiar elements were combined in a 2010 game, Alien Frontiers. Is this mix of ideas bound to be your love potion, or should you beware of this attractive package? Let's take a look. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but for this beholder, Alien Frontiers does pretty well in the looks department. The square box is 26 centimeters on a side, making it slightly smaller than most square game boxes, but also a bit more sturdy and portable. The game board is thick and covered in art and lies perfectly flat. The primary components include 24 16mm dice in four colors, small wooden gumdrop shaped tokens used to represent colonies, gray wooden cubes to represent metal, orange wooden discs to represent energy, cards, and in the most recent print run, some plastic rocket ship scoring markers. All the components are functional and durable. The colors are easy to identify, and a player's resources can be noted in a quick glance. I do have two minor complaints, though. Because the colony markers are rounded, they can be a bit difficult to quickly grab, and their simple shape doesn't really add much aesthetically to the board as they build up. Second, I find the cards unappealing. The retro sci-fi art works great on the box, but on the smaller scale of the cards, it loses something. I also did not care for the white borders or the very glossy finish on these cards, but perhaps these will be more to another's taste. On the other hand, I can't go on enough about how much I love this board. Here the artwork looks great and the deep blue and black of space makes everything stand out. But the board is not just good looking, it is also highly functional. Almost all the information you need to set up and play is integrated into the design. Scaling based on the number of players is clear, there are spaces for the two resources, the special powers of the different areas are connected with different docking stations, and the requirements of each docking station are explained with icons. In short, once you've learned the rules, you should rarely need to return to the rulebook, and new players should be able to remember what each station does after having it explained once or twice. Nevertheless, the rulebook is both thorough and well organized. Every special card or tile is explained with an example, and answers are easy to find. The one non-intuitive rule that could have been highlighted a bit more is the limit on resources, but otherwise this is a game that you should be able to play correctly right out of the box. Because of the special powers, there will inevitably arise a few questions about interpretations or timing, but these questions are unlikely to sour a gaming session. Thanks to the carefully designed board, setup time is about 2 minutes, and the game should fit easily on a card table. Thanks to the rulebook and overall design, explaining the rules should only take about 5-10 to 10 minutes, depending on how thorough you wish to be. So let's quickly review some of those rules. The basic flow of the game is as follows. On your turn, roll all your dice. You start with three, but can purchase more. You may then use alien tech cards to manipulate the dice before ultimately docking each die at an appropriate station and claiming the associated reward. The ultimate goal of this activity is to earn colonies to place on the planet, each of which is worth one point. If you have the most colonies in area, you also receive the corresponding tile, which adds a point and gives you a rule altering power. If you later lose the majority in an area, the tile goes back to the planet and you lose the point. There are also two alien tech cards that provide a single point each, but they can be stolen during the game, and there are other cards that allow you to affect the colonies by moving them around or adding energy fields. So the game boils down to a combination of dice rolling plus worker placement plus area control. The dice rolling is fairly straightforward. If you enjoy rolling dice and figuring out your best combo, then you should enjoy it in Alien Frontiers. If you don't enjoy the randomness of dice, then you probably won't enjoy them in Alien Frontiers either, even though there are several ways of strategically mitigating your luck. The area control element of the game is fairly simple. Rather than competing for areas with different amounts of points, however, you are competing for control of different special abilities. Since you will usually only be able to place one or two colonies per turn, however, and all special powers are open information, there isn't a ton you can do strategically other than swing the score by a point or two. In other words, the area control aspect of the game works fine and can add some interesting decisions, but fans of area control games shouldn't buy Alien Frontiers expecting a revolution to that genre. The real heart of the game, and the major reason you'll either bring this game to the table or put it up for auction, is the worker placement. So let's look at the various docking stations in more detail. First we have the solar converter. Energy tokens are necessary to build colonies and ships, or activate alien tech cards, so it's a good idea to always have some energy on hand. Any die roll will work at the solar converter. As clearly shown on the board, a 1 or a 2 will get you 1 energy, a 3 or 4 will get you 2, and a 5 or 6 will get you 3. There's a lot of space here, so it is difficult to block anyone, and higher numbers are simply better than low numbers, so the space itself is not that interesting. The other resource, metal, is a bit more interesting to acquire. Metal is also used to build colonies and ships, but is much harder to stockpile. Every die you place at the lunar mine gains you one metal, but here the spaces fill up quickly, making this a prime choke point. 
In addition, each die you play must be greater than or equal to the ones already there, creating more interaction and tough decisions. A 3 might get you the exact same medal as a 6, but if you play that 6 here, it makes it more difficult for your opponents. This is one of the most fun and competitive spaces, and players may dock 3 or more dice here in one turn just to thwart their opponents. The orbital market seems to exist mainly to compensate for the competitiveness of the lunar mine and possibly to make low rolls more valuable. Here you can place a matching pair of dice and use the numbers on their faces to convert energy to metal. So a pair of 1s will convert 4 energy to 4 metal, 1 for 1, while a pair of 2s only converts 4 energy to 2 metal, 2 for 1. There is a synergy of cards and tiles that can make this a very valuable space, but it has been by far the least used space in my games since pairs are so valuable elsewhere. Another space that attempts to soften the blow of unlucky dice is the colonist hub. Here you may place any numbered die and move a colony one step forward on the track towards landing on the planet. If you place two dice, you move the colony two spaces. On later turns, place more dice until the colony reaches the end of the track. Then pay an energy and a metal to move the colony to the board. Focusing on the colonist hub is a viable strategy, but basically it is a safety net so no die ever goes unused. It's a good idea for game balance, but it's not that fun. Since the numbers don't matter, the fact that you're rolling dice doesn't matter either. You also can't block anyone here since each player has exactly one track for their dice. Perhaps a necessary part of the design and an element that can be used strategically, but not one that will make you fall in love with the game. There are two other ways to get colonies on the board that are equally simple, yet much more interesting. The colony constructor requires three of a kind to activate and a payment of three metal. Because three of a kind is difficult to roll, it is very exciting when it happens naturally and very rewarding when you can use your alien tech cards to manipulate the dice into a triple. The three metal cost also means that you have to be prepared for the rare occurrence and that your opponents can make it even more difficult for you by blocking access to the mine or stealing your metal. There's luck here, but it's still very enjoyable. The other way to get a colony is through my favorite station on the board, the terraforming station. Here the rule is even simpler. Dock a six here, pay one energy and one metal, and place a colony. What makes this space so interesting is the huge cost. The ship you place here is destroyed during the terraforming process. As in most worker placement games, each extra worker is valuable, so this is a hefty price for an instant reward. Every time I've used this space, I've second guessed myself. Was it the right move? Did I cut my own throat? I love it. I wish every space had this sort of tension. Another clever space is the alien artifact, where you acquire alien tech cards. There are always three cards face up. Each time you place a die here, you may cycle the three cards and look at new ones. If your total dice pips equals or exceeds 8, you can then select one card. Besides being very important, because the special powers on the cards add a ton of life and strategy to the game, this station allows for strategic use of different dice combos. High numbers allow you to hit the 8 mark with fewer ships. However, three low numbers allows you to cycle more in search of the card you want, and blocks your opponents from getting a card. The final two spaces I don't find nearly as clever, but I will argue that your feelings about these spaces will go a long way towards deciding whether or not to purchase Alien Frontiers. The first is the shipyard. You start with three dice and acquire more here by placing a pair and paying the cost dependent on which die it is. Pretty simple. So why would this affect whether you enjoy the game or not? First, you might notice that there is always one fewer space than the number of players. This means blocking will happen frequently. At other stations, I praise the ability to block, but here it is quite frustrating. For one thing, this is a crucial place. Stopping someone from acquiring metal delays their game plan, but stopping someone from getting another die puts them well behind and means they roll fewer dice, make fewer choices, and probably have less fun. In one three-player game I played, one player never rolled more than three dice the entire game. It's not impossible to be somewhat competitive with only three dice, but it is less fun. In addition, players don't block here strategically. They block incidentally. If you roll a pair and have the necessary resources, you will almost always play to the shipyard. It's too valuable not to. If you already have your six dice, then just ignore it. In either case, you aren't making a strategic choice to block. Blocking just happens to occur. Also, in many other worker placement games, there is a maintenance cost associated with extra workers that balances their advantages. Here, you pay a couple extra resources one time. There are strategies that can succeed with fewer workers, but if nothing else, it just feels unfair watching your opponent roll six dice each turn while you only get three or four. Finally, we come to the Raiders Outpost. Here, your up till now friendly colonists become pirates through the use of a straight made up of three dice. By placing a straight, you may then steal either one tech card or any combination of four resources. However, if another player rolls a higher straight, you get bumped out and perhaps become the hunted instead of the hunter. 
There aren't a lot of interesting decisions here other than whom to steal from, but this space adds a ton of interaction and allows players to somewhat catch the leader. So why would this space affect your feelings? Well, the rest of the game can be played very casually and friendly with some slight interaction through blocking and area control. Raider's Outpost changes that. Resources aren't too difficult to get, but when someone steals all your metal, you will be mad. It can put someone in a real hole, which is sort of the point. For some, Raider's Outpost will save Alien Frontiers from being a fairly dry series of dice rolls. For others, Raider's Outpost will add some metagaming and nastiness that ruins the simple beauty of the rest of the game. I find Raider's Outpost fun, but when I play with my wife and kids, I ignore it completely. So that's an in-depth look at Alien Frontiers. Now we turn our gaze onto you, the gaming community. Who among you is a good match for this attractive game of dice rolling and placement in space? Well, let's discuss the most obvious answers first. If you just love dice games, then this is likely to be fun for you. The dice take center stage and significantly affect your strategy. On the other hand, if you are more attracted to strategic worker placement and area control games, the dice might hinder rather than enhance your experience. A more difficult group to match are sci-fi lovers. The retro art and the fact each area is named after a famous sci-fi author will delight fans of the genre, but you will quickly realize the theme goes no deeper than that. It's not clear who the players represent or what dice rolling is supposed to be. There's not even a tenuous connection between the stations and the dice. Why do you need matching ships to create a new one at the shipyard? Why can a six ship block a three ship from visiting the mine? Why are low numbered ships better at trading at the market? Who knows? The theme is pasted on, but pasted on beautifully. And what about the gamers who don't care about dice or mechanisms or theme? Gamers who just want an interesting game that they will play enough times to consider it money well spent. There are a few factors to consider if you are in this group. First, the number of players. Alien Frontiers plays two to four players and does scale fairly well. Nevertheless, a two player game will differ greatly from a four player game. A two player game allows you more opportunities to synergize your cards and tiles and thus to mitigate bad dice rolls. Since you can almost always play to the alien artifact or colonist hub, it is possible to overcome an opponent who quickly acquires all six dice. The area control element is a bit drier here, but the game seems more interesting. A four player game livens up the competition on the planet with scores going up and down constantly. There will be a great deal of downtime between turns, however, and often you will feel like you were blocked out of a space more by bad luck than good play. Another factor is the type of collector you are. The art and combination of mechanisms makes Alien Frontiers feel unique. Its clear rules and inviting look also make it less intimidating to casual gamers. On the other hand, it combines dice rolling, area control, and worker placement, and I think most would agree that there are deeper and more innovative games in each of these categories. If you'd like to have a game available for every possible situation, there are definitely situations where Alien Frontiers would be the best choice. If you only want another worker placement game if the dice add new twists to the genre, you probably will be disappointed. There are a couple spaces where the die pips are used very cleverly to add new decisions to worker placement, but more often the dice simply limit what you can do. Finally, as I said before, the shipyards and raiders outposts will affect your feelings about the game. If you can look past the overwhelming importance of the shipyard and the lack of strategy it adds, you will enjoy the game a lot more. Likewise, if the thought of stealing four metal from an opponent right before they roll three of a kind gives you goosebumps, then Alien Frontiers might be the one for you. This has been the Board Game Matchmaker, trying to help board games find gamers to love them.